I couldn't sleep all night. A foghorn was groaning incessantly on the sound, and I tossed half-sick between grotesque reality and savage, frightening dreams. Toward dawn, I heard a taxi go up Gatsby's drive, and immediately I jumped out of bed and began to dress. I felt that I had something to tell him, something to warn him about, and morning would be too late. Crossing his lawn, I saw that his front door was still open, and he was leaning against a table in the hall, heavy with dejection or sleep. Nothing happened, he said wanly. I waited, and about four o'clock she came to the window and stood there for a minute, and then turned out the light. His house never seemed so enormous to me as it did that night when we hunted through the great rooms for cigarettes. We pushed aside curtains that were like pavilions and felt over innumerable feet of dark wall for electric light switches. Once, I tumbled into a sort of splash upon the keys of a ghostly piano. There was an inexplicable amount of dust everywhere, and the rooms were musty, as though they hadn't been aired for days. I found the humidor on an unfamiliar table, with two stale, dry cigarettes inside. Throwing open the French windows of the drawing room, we sat smoking out into the darkness. You ought to go away, I said. It's pretty certain they'll trace your car. Go away now, old sport? Go to Atlantic City for a week, or up to Montreal. He wouldn't consider it. He couldn't possibly leave Daisy until he knew what she was going to do. He was clutching at some last hope, and I couldn't bear to shake him free. It was this night that he told me this strange story of his youth with Dan Cody. Told it to me as, because Jay Gatsby had broken up like glass against Tom's hard malice, and the long secret extravaganza was played out. I think that he would have acknowledged anything now, without reserve, but he wanted to talk about Daisy. She was the first nice girl he had ever known. In various unrevealed capacities, he had come in contact with such people, but always with indiscernible barbed wire between. He found her excitingly desirable. He went to her house at first with the other officers from Camp Taylor, and then alone. It amazed him. He had never been in such a beautiful house before. But what gave it an air of breathless intensity was that Daisy lived there. It was a casual thing to her as his tent was out at camp to him. There was a ripe mystery about it, a hint of bedrooms upstairs more beautiful and cool than other bedrooms, of gay, radiant activities taking place through its corridors, and of romances that were not musty and laid away already in lavender, but fresh and breathing and um, redolent <laughs> of this year's shining motor cars and of dances whose flowers were scarcely withered. It excited him, too. That many men had already loved Daisy, it increased her value in his eyes. He felt their presence all about the house, pervading the air with the shades and echoes of still vibrant emotions. But he knew he was in Daisy's house by a colossal accident. However glorious might be his future as Jay Gatsby, he was at present a penniless young man without a past, and at any moment the invisible cloak of his uniform might slip from his shoulders. So he made the most of his time. He took what he could get, ravenously and unscrupulously. Eventually, he, he took Daisy one still October night, took her because he had no real right to touch her hand. He might have despised himself, for he had certainly taken her under false pretenses. I don't mean that he had traded on his phantom millions, but he had deliberately given Daisy a sense of security. He let her believe that he was a person from much the same stratum as herself, that he was fully able to take care of her. As a matter of fact, he had no such facilities. He had no comfortable family standing behind him, and he was liable at the whim of an impersonal government to be blown around anywhere in the world. But he didn't despise himself, and it didn't turn out as he had imagined. He had intended, probably, to take what he could and go. But now he found that he had committed himself to the following of a grail. He knew that Daisy was extraordinary, but he didn't realize just how extraordinary a nice girl could be. She vanished into her rich house, into her rich, full life, leaving Gatsby nothing. He felt married to her. That was all. But when they met again, two days later, it was Gatsby who was breathless, who was somehow betrayed. Her porch was bright with the bought luxury of starshine. The wicker of the settee squeaked fashionably as she turned toward him, and he kissed her curious, lovely mouth. She had caught a cold, and had made her voice huskier and more charming than ever, and Gatsby was overwhelmingly aware of the youth and the mystery that wealth in prisons and preserves, of the freshness of many clothes, and of Daisy, gleaming like silver, safe and proud above the hot struggles of the poor. I can't describe to you how surprised I was to find out that I loved her old sport. I even hoped for a while that she'd throw me over, but she didn't, because she was in love with me too. 
She thought I knew a lot because I knew different things from her. Well, there I was, way off my ambitions, getting deeper in love every minute, and all of a sudden I didn't care. What was the use of doing great things if I could have a better time telling her what I was going to do? On the last afternoon before he went, he sat with Daisy in his arms for a long, silent time. It was a cold fall day, with fire in the room and her cheeks flushed. Now and then she moved and he changed his arm a little, and once he kissed her dark, shining hair. The afternoon had made them tranquil for a while, as if to give them a deep memory for the long parting the next day promised. They had never been closer in the month of love, nor communicated more profoundly with one another, than when she brushed silent lips against his coat shoulder, or when he touched the end of her fingers, gently, as though she were asleep. He did extraordinarily well in the war. He was a captain before he went to the front, and following the Argonne, bata following the Argonne battles, he got his majority and the command of the divisional machine guns. After the armistice, he tried frantically to get home, but some complication or misunderstanding sent him to Oxford instead. He was worried now. There was a quality of nervous despair in Daisy's letters. She didn't see why he couldn't come home. She was feeling the pressure of the world outside, and she wanted to see him and feel his presence beside her, and be reassured that she was doing the right thing after all. For Daisy was young, and her artificial world was redolent of or orchids and pleasant, cheerful snobbery, orchestras which set the rhythm of the year, summing up the sadness and suggestiveness of life in new tunes. All night the saxophones wailed the hopeless comment of the Beale Street blues, while a hundred pairs of golden and silver slippers shuffled the shining dust. At the great tea hour there was always rooms that throbbed incessantly with this low, sweet fever, while fresh faces drifted here and there like rose petals blown by the sad horns around the floor. Through this twilight universe, Daisy began to move again with the season, and suddenly she was keeping half a dozen dates a day with half a dozen men, and drowsing asleep at dawn with the beads and the chiffon in her evening dress tangled among dying orchids on the floor next to her bed. And all the time, something within her was crying for a decision. She wanted her life now, immediately, and that decision must be made of some force, of love, of money, of unquestionable practicality that was close at hand. And that force took shape in the middle of spring with the arrival of Tom Buchanan. There was a wholesome bulkiness about his person and his position, and Daisy was flattered. Doubtless, there was a certain struggle and a certain relief. The letter reached Gatsby while he was still at Oxford. It was dawn on Long Island now, and he went about opening the rest of the windows downstairs, filling the house with gray-turning and gold-turning light. The shadow of a tree fell abruptly across the dew, and ghostly birds began to sing among the blue leaves. There was a slow, pleasant movement in the air, scarcely a wind, promising a cool, lovely day. I don't think she ever loved him. Gatsby turned around from a window and looked at me challengingly. You must remember, old sport, she was very excited this afternoon. He told her those things in a way that frightened her, that made it look as if I was some kind of cheap sharper, and the result is she hardly knew what she was saying. He sat down gloomily. Of course she might have loved him for just a minute, when they were first married, and loved me even more then, do you see? Suddenly he came out with a curious remark. In any case, he said, it was just personal. What could you make of that, except to suspect some intensity in his conception of the affair that couldn't be measured? He had come back from France when Tom and Daisy were still on their wedding trip, and made a miserable but irresistible journey to Louisville on the last of his army pay. He stayed there for a week, walking the streets where their footsteps had clicked together through the November night, and revisiting the out-of-way places to which they had driven in her white car. Just as Daisy's house had always seemed to him more mysterious and gay than the other houses, so his idea of the city of itself, but even though she was gone from it, was pervaded with a melancholy beauty. He left, feeling that if he had searched harder, he might have found her, that he was leaving her behind. The day coach, he was penniless now, and was hot. He went out to the open vestibule and sat down on a folding chair, and the station slid away, and the backs of unfamiliar buildings moved by. Then out into the spring fields where a yellow trolley raced them for a minute with people in it who might once have seen the pale magic of her face along the casual street. The track curved, and now it was going away from the sun, which as it sank lower seemed to spread itself in benediction over the vanishing city, where she had drawn her breath. He stretched out his hand desperately, as if to snatch only a wisp of air to save a fragment of the spot that she had made lovely for him. But it was all going by too fast now for his blurred eyes, and he knew he had lost that part of it, the freshest and the best, forever. It was nine o'clock when we finished breakfast and went out onto the porch. The night had made a sharp difference in the weather, and there was an autumn flavor in the air, 
The gardener, the last of Gatsby's former servants, came to the foot of the steps. I'm going to drain the pool today, Mr. Gatsby. Leaves will start falling pretty soon, and there's always trouble with the pipes. Don't do it today, Gatsby answered. He turned to me apologetically. You know, old sport, I've never used that pool all summer. I looked at my watch and stood up. Twelve minutes to my train. I didn't want to go to the city. I wasn't worth a decent stroke of work, but it was more than that. I didn't want to leave Gatsby. I missed that train, and then another before I can get myself away. I'll call you up, I said finally. Do, old sport. I'll call you about noon. We walked slowly down the steps. I suppose Daisy will call too, he looked at me anxiously, as if he hoped I'd collaborate this. I suppose so. Well, goodbye. We shook hands, and I started away. Just before I reached the hedge, I remembered something and turned around. They're a rotten crowd, I shouted across the lawn. You're worth the whole bunch of them put together. I've always been glad I said that. It's the only compliment I ever gave him, because I disapproved of him from beginning to end. First he nodded politely, and then his face broke into that radiant, understanding smile, as if we had been in a static cahoots on that fact all the time. His gorgeous pink rag of a suit made a bright spot of color against the white steps, and I thought of the night when I first came to his ancestral home, three months before. The lawn and the drive had been crowded with the faces of those who had guessed at his corruption, and he had stood on those steps concealing his incorruptible dream as he waved them goodbye. I thanked him for his hospitality. We were always thanking him for that, I and the others. Goodbye, I called. I enjoyed breakfast, Gatsby.